Welcome back, everybody. Hope everyone had a good week. Um, today, the plan is to finish up chapter five, obviously, right? We'll knock that out and then we'll get into chapter six. We do have scheduled your exam number two for, for next weekend. So that will give you plenty of time to uh, prepare for. So before we begin, any questions? Comments before we uh, start up and continue where we left off. Yeah, okay. Well, this is where we left off. Let me back it up a little bit. We are in the process of uh, showing how uh, the electrons are placed around the nucleus, and we went through talked about um, how electrons are actually quantized. In other words, they are in specific energy levels. And so our model for the electrons are that they are in their seven energy levels, okay? And within the seven energy levels, there are uh, some sublevels. Now in the first energy level, there's only one sublevel, which we call orbits, and those were S orbit. Second, second energy level, there are two orbits. Those were the S and the P, okay? One S, and there are three P orbits. Each one, remember, is capable of handling two electrons, two electrons. So therefore, the maximum number of electrons for the S orbit is two, obviously. And the P is six, because there are three P orbits. Then in the third energy level, which is the third period of the periodic table, we continue with the S, we continue with the P, but then we introduce the D as in delta. The delta, there are five orbits, uh, five D orbits specifically. And again, each one can handle two electrons. So the delta, excuse me, the D orbits can handle a maximum total of 10 electrons. And then in the fourth energy level, Again, we continue with the S and the P and the D, and then we introduce the F as in Foxtrot F. And there are seven orbits, okay? There are seven F orbits. Each one can handle uh, two electrons maximum, therefore giving you a maximum of 14, 14 um, el electrons in the F orbits. Then we use a periodic table, and here's listed color coded, where we had the last two, the first two uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, elements, the first two columns. We said, uh, think of those as what well, we're going to call them the S of block, S block. We called it for two electrons per S. There are two columns. So, first column would be S1, the first electron. The coefficient of the electron configuration is represents the energy level, followed by the letter S, P, D, or F. And then the exponent of the orbit represents the number of electrons in, in that particular orbit, okay? So the uh, second column represents the S2, so two electrons are full. The yellow ones represent the P block. Note that there are six columns. Also note that the P can handle six electrons. So starting with the first one with boron, going across, you go P1, P2, P3, P6. Then the, the red ones, the inside, the B elements, as we call them, they're, they're not the A elements having the, the letter capital A. These are the B. They have a specific name. We're going to learn about those next chapter. But note that there are 10 columns there, OK? And there are 10 electrons. So if you start the far left, you got D1 all the way across to D10. And then finally, the ones in the bottom are the F block, and there are 14 columns there. So that helps you try to, uh, to fill up the electron configuration as per where they're at in the position of the, in the position, their position in the periodic table. All uh, right. Okay. So we went through sodium. Okay, and, and like I said, you can, for example, use the sequence here in the bottom left, the bottom image where you go 1s, 2s, 2p, 3p, 3s, et cetera, et cetera, and memorize that if you want. Or you can just use the position of the element in the periodic table. 
And I tend to prefer to use the periodic table to help me with electron configurations. Okay, so what I do first, to refresh your memory, I may have talked about this here. Let's talk about sodium. We're going to do sodium first. And so I find its position on the periodic table, and it's right there, sodium. Okay, so that means that being in the third energy level, okay, because there's one, two, and three, it's in the third energy level, and it's in the first column. So that tells me that its outermost shell is the 3s1. There's only one electron in the outermost shell. And then the rest, the, the inner electrons in the inner layers, one and two, are full. Okay, so if you count the superscripts there, you'll see 11 electrons with the 3s1 being the outermost shell, the outermost shell aka the valence all right if we look at oxygen oxygen is sitting right here okay we see that oxygen's in the second energy level second period and so the 2s electrons are full so that's them and then it is in the fourth column of the p block that tells me there are four electrons p4 and that's right there 2p4 that means the innermost shell is full obviously right so we fill that up simply with 1s2 also you can see that the oxygen is in group 6a 6a so that roman numeral on top of the group tells me how many valence electrons that everybody in that group have for oxygen there's six there's four in the p M2 in the S, a total of four valence electrons, okay? The other elements below it also have six, but theirs will be in the next energy level, will be in the 3S2, 3P4, and 4S2, 4P4, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So that's what they share in common, and that's why those elements within the group, with, specifically within the A elements, share... Uh, properties of reactivity because they share the number of valence electrons, the outermost electrons. All right, we got calcium sitting right here. Okay, go through the same scenario. I see that it's in the fourth energy level and it's in the second column of the S block in, uh, elements. And there it is right there, 4S2. Automatically, quickly just fill in 4S2. And then the rest, everything from one to three levels are full. Okay, which happens to be the number of electrons for argon. Okay, from, from here to here. All right, and then chlorine. You can see that chlorine's in group seven. It's in the third energy level. And so those seven electrons are right here. Two of them are in the 3S orbit, and five of them are in the 3P orbit. So it'd be 3P5. All right, so that's using the elect the uh, periodic table to help you to uh, write the electron configuration for these elements, okay? Or you can use the image down the bottom half of the screen. But the top image kind of shows you where, you know, how as we go across the periodic table and how the, the valence shells add up. So uh, this this... Um, periodic table on top will help you again with the electron configuration. Now, do note, do note this. These what we call the D blocks. Okay. Whoa. All right. For Chem 130, we're just going to name it. If, we, if you have, happen to get into the D blocks for any reason, and you're going to go across, it's simply sequential, D1 to D4. You can see that in reality, it does hop around. We got a D3 and then a D5, et cetera. So for Chem and, and this, that goes beyond the scope of, of Chem 130, but for Chem 130, sequentially D1 to D10, and the same is true for the F. Okay, so F1 to F14. Okay. Okay, uh, noble gases, those are the 
those are the ones in the last column of the periodic table. Okay, now they are stable, extremely stable, and happy for you know, for lack of a better term, happy in the sense that they're not very reactive. Why? Because they have that magical eight number. Okay, the noble gases in the very last column in the right, group 8A, Roman numeral 8A, are called noble gases for a reason. They're very unreactive. And they're unreactive because the magical eight has been obtained. That means that there are eight valence electrons on the outermost shell. The only exception is helium. Helium, it only has two, okay? And so if we look at, if we look at the, um, the noble gases, okay, which is right here, all of them right here, with the exception of helium, which its magical number is two, everybody else here has eight valence electrons, okay? That magical number eight is, is what is the driving force for chemical, a lot of chemical reactions. It is a driving force that, it, that what's going to happen, we're going to learn, is the elements are going to strive when they come in together to make a compound to maintain eight electrons around its outermost shell. Okay? And, with, and with respect to some compounds, what's going to happen, and we're going to learn about those, is that by losing electrons or gaining electrons, they will then obtain that magical eight. You think about it, if you lose an electron for the outermost shell, well, the next valence uh, shell is full. The next one comes in, right? So now it's full and we got, the, we got that happy eight, okay? If you gain electrons, if you hear the noise in the background, we've got landscaping going on, so my apologies. Um, if you gain electrons to fill that outermost shell, again, you might have like seven valence electrons and you just simply need to pick up one to fill that, get that magical eight. So the driving force is, is that, that magical eight number. And you're going to see some examples of that here in a bit. Okay, um, so the configuration of an S2P6, regardless of what energy level, uh, and this would be from two down, two to seven, having that kind of configuration is a very stable configuration. Helium has a, has a, a 1s2. Okay, that's it, just 1s2, that's why it has a magical 2. So build, getting that eight, eight outermost valence electrons uh, allow that element to become a, to be in a stable state, okay? Remember that valence electrons are simply those electrons in the outermost layer, okay? And the core electrons are the ones inside, inside the outermost layer. For example, if we do the electron configuration of phosphorus, okay, you'll see 3P right here, 3P2, 3P6, 3. Phosphorus is right here, okay? Right above nitrogen. That is the outermost uh, uh, shell or the valence shell. It has five valence electrons. Note too that on the periodic table, you'll see Roman numeral 5A. That Roman numeral 5 tells you there's five valence electrons, everybody in that group, in that particular group. Okay? The only difference is they'll be in a different energy level. For phosphorus, it's in the third energy level, meaning that there are five valence electrons. Two of them are in the S orbit, and three of them are in the P orbit, okay? Now, think about this. Phosphorus has five valence electrons. Now, if you think about this for a second, from an energy perspective, and, and keeping in mind that Mother Nature is, you know, it's not going to work. It <laughs> work for a living, so to speak. It's going to take the easy route. And so you put in your, you think, give this some thought. Would it be easier to remove five electrons or simply pick up three, okay? 
it's a I got I got to expel energy for five electrons, and maybe not so much energy adding three. So obviously you can see that phosphorus will have a tendency to pick up three electrons. Now I want you to put this in long-term memory. Non-metals, non-metals, and that's these guys up over here, the green and the, and the yellowish green color here. Non-metals want to gain electrons. Metals, which are basically everybody else over here, okay, want to lose electrons. Okay, so phosphorus is a non-metal. It has room for three electrons. And when it has three electrons, now it's going to pick up the electron configuration like the gas in front of it, which is argon. Okay, it does not become argon, but it shares the number, same number of total electrons as argon. Okay. And it picked up a charge of a negative three because those electrons each have a negative charge. There's three of them gives you an overall net of three. Phosphorus is an element. Right now, as it stands right now, has a net charge of zero because an equal number of protons, equal number of electrons. The moment it picks up three, this three electrons become six. It picks up three electrons, so it has an overall charge of negative three charge. But more on that here in, in, in a little bit. But you, I'm trying to introduce you as to why chemical reactions occur in the manner they occur. Okay, because the driving force is to find a means to get that happy eight. In this case, it gained electrons. And when it gained electrons, now I got eight electrons in the beta shell. When we get the example of a metal, you're going to see how by losing an electron, it's going to have the next shell in will be the beta shell, which is full and it has eight. All right, so how do we determine the number of valence electrons? And this is only true for the A elements, okay? Because the, the, the B elements are very unpredictable. Let me go back here for a second. And so we're talking about, you know, just the A elements. So here, here, and then these guys here. By looking at the group number that they're in, and that's everybody here and everybody here, okay? By looking at the group number, we can determine how many valence electrons it has. And we need to learn this because we're gonna, we're gonna have a, uh, something called Lewis dot structures down the road. And again, we'll come back to its position on the product table to tell us how many valence electrons it has, so we can draw the, the correct of Lewis dot structure. Okay, so. Let's go back to the slide. And so if we look at chlorine, we find that chlorine is in group seven. Okay, that means there's seven valence electrons. If we look at beryllium, it's in group 2A, two valence electrons. And if we look at aluminum, it is in group 3A, three valence electrons, okay? And so there's the electron configuration for chlorine, okay? Seven valence electrons, two of them in the S, five of them in the P. Beryllium has two valence electrons that occupy the second energy level. And then aluminum has three valence electrons that occupy the third energy level, two of them in the S, one of them in the P, because it's part of the P block in the very first column of the P block. All right. And so I'm hoping that you can start seeing a little trend here by, look, by analyzing the electron configuration. You can see that chlorine here has room for one more electron and it's a non-metal. So it's gonna pick up an electron, have an overall negative charge, right? Beryllium, one, point number one, it's, it is a metal. And like I stated, it's going to lose electrons. So it's specifically, it is gonna lose the, these two in the outermost shell. Then the next 
innermost shell is fairly stable, very stable, okay, but you have a plus two charge. Okay, beryllium is number, number uh, four. And then aluminum has in the outermost shell, the valence shell, three valence electrons. It's a metal, so it's going to lose those three, resulting in an aluminum plus three ion. And the next, the innermost shell now is full with a magical eight. So it's either trying to obtain a magical eight or a magical two. Beryllium being the smaller one is, is the two. And it's going to pick up. Um, now, some people have asked me, well, look, oh, well, you got you got beryllium with 2s2. You know, it's already got two. But the magical number for the second energy level is eight. Okay, so for beryllium to be happy, if you will, it needs to it needs to pick up six electrons. Well, from an energy perspective, that's not very efficient, nor you know, it's not favorable. And so it's much easier to get rid of those two than it is to pick up six to fill up the the two the two s and the two p orbits. Okay, so that's why it prefers to give up those two. Okay, let's clear this up. All right, so using, like I stated, the group number in Roman numerals, okay, only for the A, that would tell you how many valence electrons everybody has in that particular group. And the number goes from the far left from one to eight, okay? And as I stated, the only exception is helium, which is in group 8A, but it doesn't have any electrons. It has two. Be careful, as you know, they might ask you, what's the what is what is the number of valence electrons? Why? I mean, sometimes there's questions that say, you know, uh, why is helium so stable? People put an answer is because it's got eight valence electrons. Well, that would be incorrect. Okay, it only has two, two valence electrons. You know, you might say, well, fine, it doesn't make sense. Think about it now. Think about it. Okay. In order to for helium to pick up, let me, let me find this position in our periodic table so you can maybe visually see what I'm talking about. Okay. Here's helium right here. In order to pick up six electrons, eight electrons, right? It needs to fill up the second energy level. Well, it's, you know, that's not energetically favorable because now it's going to have eight, eight electrons plus a two. Okay, that's 10 electrons, and it only has two protons. Extremely unstable, okay? All right, hopefully that makes a little more sense, at least with respect to helium. Right. right. This is pretty self-explanatory. You look up you look up the um, um, element in this uh, periodic table on the periodic table. Find the group number it's in. You'll see that strontium is in group two, has two valence electrons. Bromine, like all the group seven, has seven electrons. Argon is a noble gas, has eight valence electrons. Silicon is in group four, right underneath uh, carbon, has four valence electrons and sulfur, sulfur has sticks, okay? Now, important factor to take away from this, we're talking about valence electrons. It didn't say total electrons, it asked for the valence electrons, and that is the number of electrons in the outermost shell only, okay? Um, well, again, we're going to get more into detail about this in the next chapter, but the driving force in making bonds in molecules is to obtain that magical eight, okay? And in, to, in doing that, it's going to do it one or two ways. It's going to gain electrons or lose electrons, okay? Or that's for one type of compound. And there's two types of compounds. I'm kind of, I'm trying to and not give you too much information on what's coming up, but there's, of all the compounds that we work with, there's only two types. Okay, one, one's called ionic, one's called covalent. We'll learn more about that in a second. But in both examples, 
the ultimate goal, the both types of compounds, the ultimate goal is to get that eight octet rule around it. For the uh, uh, molecular compounds or covalent compounds, as I call them, they do that by sharing electrons with each other, okay, to get that eight. The other type that are what I call ionic, they do that, and we're going to talk mostly about those for a bit. They do that by either gaining electrons or losing electrons. Okay. Gaining or losing electrons. For example, this is specifically for when we start talking about ionic compounds. And the thing is about ionic compounds is this. And I think one way, I think I need to introduce that now. Ionic compounds, think of them as magnets. I got my two magnets here. They come together and they have an attraction to each other because one of them is positive. For right now, one's positive and one's negative. Obviously, uh, the magnets don't have the charge north and the, in the north and the south, but treat this as ions. One's a positive charge and one's a negative charge, and they come together like man magnets and attach to each other, attract each other. They don't make a bond. In fact, if I were to place these, compounds in water, a lot of them completely break apart and dissociate. That's what happens when you take sodium chloride, table salt, you put it in water and it dissolves in water and it breaks up. Pure water does not conduct electricity. But I put a little pinch of salt, it puts ions in solution, and now that water conducts electricity. Okay. Now, covalent compounds or molecular compounds actually share bonds, share electrons. They don't break apart when you put them in water. They stay intact. So water going into water stays as H2O, okay? Carbon dioxide dissolved in water stays as carbon dioxide. But sodium chloride put in water dissociates into ion. All right, so we're going to talk mostly about ionic compounds and what what's, gets them going with respect to chemistry. Uh, let's look at, again, the... Um, electronic configuration of chlorine. You got a question? Uh, you asked their balance, balance how a sheet? You mean ionic compounds when they come together? Yeah, I was just uh, kind of looking over what you were saying and trying to make it up in my own words. And I'm guessing the eight uh, electrons that they need is just for them to become balanced. So uh, well, not to become balanced, but to become stable. And to obtain the eight electrons level on the outside, maybe when we go through this, it will become clear, okay? Because uh, becoming more stable is one, it's going to happen one or two ways. It's going to lose an electron or it's going to gain an electron. So let's do an example. Maybe it will become clearer and then we can... If you still don't see it, let me know and we'll, we'll talk about it. If you look at the electron configuration of sodium, it is as follows, okay? okay? Sodium is in group one, right? Group one's in the third energy level. So the, the number of valence electrons that sodium has is one. And that is denoted by the 3S1 configuration here. Okay, sodium has 11 electrons. Okay, one of those electrons is on the outermost shell, which is the third energy level. Now, take a look at the, the next level in, which is the second energy level. The second two, 2s2, 2p6. Aren't they not eight electrons there? Right? So if I were to kind of draw a picture, uh, here's the nucleus. It's got three energy levels. These half circles represent the three energy levels there. We got two electrons in the first one denoted by one S. And then we got uh, uh, eight electrons in the second energy level denoted by 2S2, 2P6. And then we got one electron in the outermost shell, okay? You see how that how that looks based on the electron configuration? Now, what's going to happen is 
Point number one, sodium is a metal. And like I stated, all metals lose electrons, all metals. Sodium is a metal, it's gonna lose an electron. And the number of electrons it loses depends on the group that is in. If it's in group one, there's only one valence electron in the outermost shell, and it's gonna lose the outermost shell. That electron will disappear or go someplace, okay? And now the new valence shell is what? Is in the second energy level. You see that? And it becomes an ion because to begin with, Sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons. 11 positives, 11 negatives, they cancel out. I got, a, I got an atom with a net charge of zero. By losing that valence electron, now I still have 11 protons, but now I got 10 electrons. So my net now is a positive one. Okay, positive one charge right here. So this is an ion. This is what you ingest. This is what you put on French fries. You don't put this guy in your French fries. It wouldn't be, it, it'd be kind of messy because sodium metal reacts ag aggressively with water and moisture to generate a lot of heat and uh, hydrogen gas, which then explodes, okay? But the sodium ion is what you have in your body, the sodium, is what's carrying the electrical charges through your body, along with other ones, not just sodium. Sodium is very crucial in the multiple things, sodium ion, very crucial in the multiple of things going on in your body, uh, even heart, muscle contraction, and so forth. However, too much sodium can cause a problem, like blood pressure, things like that, okay? All right, but now look at this. That's, that's the thing I want you to take away from this, by losing one electron, the next shell, which is the second energy level, is full. And it has a pain, that magical eight number, eight electrons, okay? So it's not really balanced at this time. We can't talk about balancing. We're talking about stability. Okay, so it's not very stable with that one electron sitting out there, okay? We'd rather just get rid of it. All right, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. And let's take a look at sulfur, okay? Sulfur also is in the third energy level. Okay, so if we were gonna draw what we did up here earlier, here's the nucleus where we got one, two, and three. So it has uh, two electrons in the first energy level 80 electrons in the second energy level, but only six in the outermost shell. This in group six, right? Roman numeral V I A, group six. That means there's six valence electrons. There to sodium metal that had one valence electron. So it, it's the the three P is empty, and one and one of the S has room. I mean, there's seven empty electrons in the sodium. There's only one out there. The sulfur has six. So again, from an energy perspective, two points. One, sodium is a non-metal, okay? And non-metals gain electrons. And it can gain electrons, why? Because sodium, uh, sulfur, has room for two electrons in that P orbit because there's only four in the P. And remember the P can handle a total of six. So it's going to pick up two electrons, okay? So being in group six tells you that, that those elements in group six, when they become ions, they will, all of them will gain two electrons to get the, to that magical eight number. And now the electron configuration is as follows. You can see that the valence shell is full by gaining two electrons. And now the, the other aspect is this, is sulfur starts with 16 protons, 16 electrons, net zero. 
when it becomes an ion, because it's a non-metal, it's going to gain electrons, it still has 16 protons, but now has 18 protons. So 16 positives, 18 negatives, the net is a negative two. Okay? All right. And plus it becomes a charge. An ion with a negative two. Now, whether you write two negative or minus two, it makes no difference either way. Still a negative two either way you write it. But the driving force here is to obtain that magical eight number. The octet rule has been fulfilled when the sulfur ion, a uh, sulfur atom becomes ionic, it gain two electrons. Now, the other aspect to remember here for the nomenclature part of this, that non-metals, like I stated, gain electrons, always. When they gain electrons to become an ion, we have to change its name. So sulfur is the name for the atom. The moment it becomes an ion, we change the name to sulfide. Okay, so this sulfide represents it, sulfur negative two charge. Sulfur itself is the atom. All nonmetals, so oxygen becomes oxide. Do you want to take a guess of what chlorine becomes, name wise, when it becomes an ion? Take a wild guess. If sulfur becomes sulfide, oxygen becomes oxide, nitrogen becomes oxide, excuse me, nitrogen becomes nitride, what does chlorine become, name-wise? What do you think? Chloride. You got it. Bromine becomes bromide, iodine becomes iodide. Okay, so the IDE tells you you're dealing with the ion, okay? The sulfur, the, the name itself tells you you're dealing with the element. Okay. Now, for the for the metals, when they change their name, they don't, um, excuse me, when they become ions, their name doesn't change. So sodium remains sodium, be it an atom or an ion. And the only way we distinguish them is say it's, it is the sodium atom or it is the sodium ion. That's all. But the anion, the, the negative part, total name change. Okay. All right. So I hope that kind of explains, we're, you know, we're not talking about uh, balancing here. We are talking about um, losing electrons or gaining electrons so that the new, oct um, the new valence shell has eight electrons around it. And by losing or gaining electrons, you become an ion. And if you lose electrons, you become a positive ion. And if you gain electrons, you become a negative ion, okay? And so it is these guys, the sodium ion and the sulfide ion, they come together to make compounds. So I got a sodium and a sulfide. They come together and we can make sodium sulfide. Yeah, you got it. That's right. Chlorine, chloride, excuse me. Um, uh, the nomenclature, by the way, I good thing I mentioned it. Don't forget about the nomenclature exam. Um, you know, you have an unlimited number of them. Some of you have already completed. I think I got three of you who have done it. You got to score at least 80%. Okay. And you have multiple of, uh, of, of, um, Attempts and uh, give me one second. Multiple attempts, and uh, you have to score eight percent. I go in there and look in there and check your answers. There are some answers that are correct, so I'm, I see some of you who have done it. I went in there. You may see me. I gave you credit for for some of the answers because uh, Canvas. Canvas sometimes, I worry about it. <laughs> but uh, uh, don't forget about it because it does play a, a big part of your grade. I will, in a couple of weeks, insert a zero in the grade to give you an idea of the effect that it can have. 
Okay. And it's just a reminder of, you know, 10% of your overall grade is a, it could be a big factor. All right. So let's continue. All right, here we're asking to write the electron configuration. Now, where the mistake happens for students here is they don't read the formula very, or in this case, the, the element very well. They look at it and they see K and they think the atom. But please note, superscript plus one, that is the ion, okay? And on all of these, you got the, it's the ions of nitrogen and the ions of magnesium and potassium. And so they're either going to be minus a proton electron or plus some electrons, depends on the charge. And so we have potassium ion, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Now, uh, potassium is 4. If it were the ion, then it would be 4s1, right? Everything else is the same. But this would be the potassium atom. And having one valence electron, it is going to lose that one valence electron because it's a metal to form the plus one charge. So now it's a new electron valence shell would be the third energy level, and we have eight electrons around it, which is the same number of electrons as argon, okay? Important point here, potassium ion does not become argon. It shares the same number of electrons as argon. So we have a name for that called isoelectronic. The potassium ion will become isoelectronic with the noble gas argon. And in order for potassium to become argon, what must happen? Anybody know? What, what must happen for potassium to physically become argon? What defines an atom? Which subatomic particle defines an atom? Does the electron define an atom? No. Does the neutron define an atom? No. The proton, right? So potassium must lose a proton to become argon. It didn't lose a proton here. It lost electrons. Okay. All right. Uh, nitrogen. normally would have the electron configuration of uh, 1s2, 2s2, 2p3, nitrogen, right? It's a non-metal. It's going to pick up three electrons, right? And it puts them in the p orbit to give it an overall negative three charge. And now its electron configuration is like neon plus its name now becomes nitride or nitrogen, okay? And then we have magnesium. Its electron configuration is as follows. Magnesium is in group uh, three. So magnesium metal will be 3s2. It's two valence electrons. It's a metal. It will lose those electrons because it's a metal. Become a plus two charge. And that's a new electron configuration. Again, the driving force here is, uh, let me highlight that is that the, the new valence shell of the ions generated now have eight electrons around it, okay? Like the noble gas nearest. For metals, as a general guideline, 
for those metals on group one and group two, when they lose electrons, they become isoelectronic with the metal, with the noble gases behind it. So potassium, which is number what, 19, now ha has the same number of electrons as argon, which is number 18 behind it. Nitrogen, by gaining three electrons to become nitride, becomes isoelectronic with a noble gas in front of it, neon. Okay. All right, so I hope you can see here what the driving force is. Now, right now we are talking about, remember I mentioned that we have two types of compounds and we're, we're talking mostly about ionic compounds. Ionic compounds that are gonna be produced because now I can put, I can put potassium and, and nitride together to make potassium nitride. Or I can put magnesium and nitride together, make magnesium nitride, or sodium nitride, or lithium nitride, calcium nitride. I'm beginning to build up a, a database of compounds that I can start putting together. You know, we should at this time maybe have at least two, three hundred compounds that we can put together, okay? And to start creating, you know, the compounds now. For me, the, L, the uh, periodic tables like the letters of the alphabet, okay? And now what we're going to start to do is start to put those letters together to uh, make uh, words. And then we're going to start putting these words together to make chemical reactions. They're going to be reacting with each other to make new products, All right? So this is part of the, the trip, so to speak. <laughs> of getting to the point where we can actually work with chemical reactions and put them together and balance them and do calculations with them. Okay, so again, um, <clears throat> it's kind of a, an overkill, but you know, if it's there again, it's, maybe it's important. So 1A, when they become ionic, we'll end up with a plus one charge, okay? Plus one charge, group 2A elements will be a plus two charge. Okay. And the group three metals, 3A, will be a plus three ion. So we got plus one, plus two, plus three ions. That charge represents how many electrons they lost. Okay. And this is when they have a plus charge that tells you it is a metal because again, only metals lose electrons. Losing electrons gives you a net positive charge. Some people have asked me about what is the difference between if I write plus then the number or do I write number and the plus makes no difference. Tomato, tomorrow, it's still, still the same thing. You can write it either way you want, okay? Uh, group seven, because they are non-metals, remember where they're at. There are seven valence electrons. They're only one away from picking up, uh, getting to the magical eight. They're only one electron away. And so group seven uh, atoms, become, when they become ionic, will end up with a negative one charge because they picked up one electron. Furthermore, they change the name to whatever it is, and you add the extension IDE. So fluorine becomes fluoride, okay? You brush your teeth in the morning, you're using fluorinated toothpaste, you're brushing your teeth with a fluoride IDE, not with a fluorine, okay? Um, and so it's some kind of stannous fluoride, which is basically tin, T-I-N, or it's maybe a sodium fluoride. So you're dealing with the ion. The group, the guys in group six, non-metals, they have six valence electrons. They're only two away from having that magical eight. So they have a tendency to pick up two electrons. And when they do that, they have a negative two charge, okay? Negative two charge. So oxygen becomes O with a negative two charge. And we also change its name to oxide. Okay. Nonmetals want to gain electrons, okay, as we stated. So group seven, here's the charges again, okay. Now, what about group four? Well, we'll talk about that here in a second. 
in general, overemphasis again, metals lose electrons, they become, they have their own special name, cations. Right now, up to this point, I was just saying ions. But now specifically, the metals that lose electrons become and have a positive charge, their own name, their own name are cations, C-A-T-I-O-N-S, okay? The nonmetals gaining electrons, now their general name are anions, anions. Uh, sometimes it helps the N for, in anions reminds me of negative. Mm -hmm. So that's how I keep them straight, at least way back when. After a while, I use them so much, they just second nature, okay? Now, what about group 4A? Okay, 4A, think of these guys as being on the fence, okay? To the left of the fence is the positive charges, okay? To the right of the fence are negatives. The guys on the fence, it depends on the conditions. They have the capability, for, because again, from energy perspective, they got four valence electrons. That's why they group four. And so it is just as energetically favorable if they lose those four or they pick up four, okay? And so they can have a range of charges from a negative four to a positive four, depending on what happens to them. So very unique position. Carbon happens to be in that position, okay? And carbon is a very special compound, the things, what it can do. The most important thing about carbon that it can build bonds with other carbons. Not all of the atoms can do that, which is a good thing for us because we're made up of chains of carbon. And that ability wasn't available, then we wouldn't exist in the manner that we exist now. And a group 8A, of course, they're stable. They're not, nothing's going to happen to them. They got a net zero charge, not very reactive. Uh, the, same, the same is true for helium. Remember that, but helium has two electrons. Everybody else has eight around the valence shell. And so this particular sequence kind of gives you across the table. And again, only for the A metals. Those are the ones that are the Roman numeral A. The A elements, I should say, not metal, say eight. A as an apple elements, one through eight. All right, so <laughs> you could be asked the question of we got a list of elements here, and you can ask, okay, what kind of charge will they become? All right, well, I'm going to go through it through a systematic approach first. And then, you know, after a while, when you do a number of these, it's become second nature to you. Point number one, step number one, determine whether it is a metal or a non-metal. Okay, you might say, well, I'm not sure. All right, well, I direct you to the periodic table. All right, now on the periodic table, in fact, you'll find them in, in most any periodic table, you will see a stair step. Okay. On the stair step, just on the stair step, you those are the metalloids. Okay. They're semi-metals or semi-metals or the metal metalloids. They have met properties of metals and non-metals. Now we won't be working a lot with these guys. All right. But to the right of the metal. Metalloids of the star step are the nonmetals. And so we're looking at all these guys right here, right here, right here. Okay, those are the nonmetals plus hydrogen way over here. Don't forget him, hydrogen. And then to the left of those of the star step, all these guys right here that I'm circling. In here and up in here, those are metals, and including these down here. They all had a special name. And so that's important that you realize who's a metal, who's a non-metal, because that's once you determine who's a metal and a non-metal, they have to determine what kind of charge they're going to have. Why? Metals lose electrons, they become positive. Non-metals gain electrons, they become negative. Okay except the uh, noble gases, okay? I didn't, noble gases do not do anything. So it's everybody 
inside the normal gas to the left. <laughs> the other reason it's important to know that is because I mentioned to you there's two types of compounds. One we call ionic, and that's a combination between the metal and a non-metal like sodium chloride. The other type is called covalent or molecular. We'll, we'll have more on that, but that on that later on. But that's a combination of two nonmetals, hence carbon dioxide. Carbon and oxygen are both nonmetals. Water, H2O, two nonmetals, hydrogen and oxygen. Okay. They have a special type of properties in the way they bond compared to the nonmetals. Okay. So and that tell, and once we identify who's what, that, that, that opens up a lot of other things as far as properties. It's very, very uh, important that we recognize what type of compound we're dealing with. So let's go back to this. And my first thing that I would do is I would identify the metals and the nonmetals. So lithium is a metal. So I'm going to, I know it's going to have a positive charge. The magnitude, I'm not worried about it right now. I just want to know positive or negative. Magnesium is a positive charge because it's a metal. Sulfur is, an, is a non-metal. So it's going to have a negative charge. Bromine is a non-metal. It's going to have a negative charge. Nitrogen is a non-metal. It will have a negative charge. And aluminum is a metal. So it's going to have a positive charge. So this is just, I'm writing down the type of charge. That's all I'm doing. Now, the actual magnitude it means how much of a charge is dependent on the group that it's in. And so now I use the periodic table and I locate lithium. I see that lithium is in group one. Plus, it's a metal. Plus, I know it's going to be a positive charge. So therefore, it will have a plus one charge. So I can write it as Li with a positive one. Okay. Magnesium, I just identified as a, as a metal. Identify as a positive charge. Identify it on the periodic table. It's a group two. It will have a plus two charge. Okay. Sulfur is a nonmetal. It will have a negative charge. Find it on the periodic table. It's in group six. That tells you it would have. It will pick up two electrons to get to that magical eight. Bromine, similar situation. It's a nonmetal. It's going to have a negative charge. It's in group seven. It's going to have a negative one charge. Nitrogen is in group five. It's a nonmetal. It will have a negative charge. The magnitude will be negative three because it's a group five and it needs three electrons to get that eight. And then aluminum is in group three A. Being a metal is going to lose electrons, three of them specifically. So it ends up with a plus three charge. Okay. So given this type of question, three hash, identify the type. The type of charge, identify metal, non-metal, and then identify the magnitude depending on where they're at on the periodic table. Okay. Now, also keep in mind with respect to the name. Remember, ah, that's terrible. My pen really. With the the naming, the nomenclature, that's what it's all about. All the metals, the name stays the same. So it's lithium ion, magnesium ion, aluminum ion. Okay, so there's no name change there. That one in doubt. Sulfur becomes sulfide. Bromine becomes bromide. And nitrogen becomes nitride. Okay. And now we can also start thinking about putting these together to make compounds because these type of compounds are that, that group called ionic compounds where I got a positive and negative come together. You won't find two negatives come together to make a compound, nor would you find 
two positives coming together to make the compound. You will find a positive and a negative. So I can mix and match here. So I can take lithium and hook it up with sulfide to make, guess what? Lithium sulfide. Or I can hook it up with bromide, lithium bromide, or lithium nitride. I can do the same with aluminum. Aluminum nitride, aluminum bromide, aluminum sulfide. And obviously, the same thing with magnesium, magnesium sulfide, magnesium bromide, magnesium nitride. Okay? We're doing, starting to put things together. Now, right now, we haven't talked about how many of each we need to put in because the rule to remember when we mix, put them together, I have, I have to have enough positives and enough negatives that come together to cancel each other out, okay? And so if I do magnesium sulfide, magnesium has a plus two, sulfide has a negative two. So that simply is, the formula would be that, okay? But if I take lithium and I, want, and I have uh, nitride, Notice lithium has a plus one charge and nitride has a negative three. So I, I, I got to have three lithiums and I write a subscript. Okay, because that subscript tells me I got three lithiums for every one nitride. So that is a formula for lithium nitride. Okay. All right, so that's the beginnings of putting compounds together and naming. So now you probably got maybe a combination. If you look at the elements, probably a combination of about four or 500 compounds you can put together. I mentioned isoelectronic. All that means is they share the same number of electrons, okay? And the driving force of, of atoms to when they gain or lose electrons is to become isoelectronic with a noble gas. So the magnesium ion becomes isoelectronic with neon. And the phosphide, notice the phosphorus, when it becomes ion, has a negative charge, just like nitrogen, okay? It's nitrogen became nitride, this becomes phosphide. Okay, it's isoelectronic with argon. So we can um, take a table, for example, like we have calcium, uh, and oxide, chloride, and aluminum, and they want to do electron configurations. Well, we, we've done a few, so those are the electron configurations for the ions. Remember that. Look at the formula. It's Ca plus 2. They're not asking about the electron configuration for the calcium atom. They're asking for the calcium ion, the plus 2. So there's the electron configuration. You can see here that it is isoelectronic with argon. The oxide is isoelectronic with a neon. The chloride is isoelectronic with argon. And the aluminum is isoelectronic with neon. Again, I can overemphasize, isoelectronic does not mean that the calcium ion became argon. Please, that's totally incorrect. It means that they share the same number of electrons. And again, the driving force is to be in a more stable state, which is having eight electrons around the valence shell. And it does that by these elements do that by either losing electrons or gaining electrons. Uh, we had a table like this before, it's a little bit different. You know, we got selenium 78. Okay, the difference between the two here in the first two columns and one's an ion is a negative two. So that tells me, hey, maybe it's a group 6A. If you look, find it, you'll find it to be that's the case. So it's a nonmetal, picked up two electrons as a negative two case. Now, obviously, they're going to have the same number of protons. Okay, and that's true also for aluminum 27 here. Same number of protons either is the element or the ion. Nothing's changed there. And the, only, and the same number of neutrons, the only thing that has changed 
is the number of electrons. And it'd be less than what they started off with if it's a metal, or more than they started off with if it's a non-metal. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to chapter, the end of chapter five. What I want to do, let's take a, a 10 minute break and um, we will continue with uh, chapter six. So I got 10.05, let's say we come back at, uh, let's, uh, excuse me, 2.05, let's go to 2.20, let's just do 2.20. Be back in 2.20, guys. Okay. Any questions? All right. Um, let me jump into this one, chapter six, very short chapter. Okay. Uh, some of the stuff I already kind of introduce as we go along. I tend to do that. I try to introduce you a little bit of, of the information that, that is coming. Uh, so sometimes you have to because the uh, material, if I throw it at you, you're like, hey, what is this, you know? And try to give you a little taste of it. And then when we get to it, we get a little bit more detail. All right, this deals with the periodic table and the periodic, periodic table in itself, just by itself, that's it. And some trends that we already talked about. All right, uh, well, this periodic table, the concept of the periodic table came about ooh, way back when, 1869. This gentleman here, <laughs> Dmitry Mendeley, German, uh, Russian scientist, he came up with his uh, first periodic table. And what he did was, of the elements known at that time, he arranged them uh, and put them in the in groups that uh, exhibited similar properties, put them in the same column, okay? Which is kind of amazing because, you know, this is way before even our theory about electrons and their energy. And we just talked about valence electrons and why these, these in the product tip of why these elements behave very similar because that same number of valence electrons. And yet here he is, you know, back in 1869, coming up with that, periodic table that put the, everything in, in similar properties was pretty cool. The other aspect about his periodic table was that there were some blanks in there. There were some missing elements. And they were that with, what that meant was it predicted that there would be a particular element in there. And that just uh, caused a whole slew of uh, research looking for those elements. And sure enough, little by little, they got, they got filled in. Okay. So that was uh, Mendeley way back in 1869. Uh, another scientist came, came along, Moseley. He rearranged the periodic table. He, what he did, he put them in increasing atomic number. And this is basically the periodic table that we utilize now, okay? And came up with the periodic law, which states that elements in the same column have same or similar properties, which is what Mendeley was doing. So, you know, so now we know they have similar properties simply because the number of valence electrons are the same, at least for the A elements. Now, you've noticed that the periodic table that we show, there's two rows in the bottom that are actually, you know, out. And what that is, just to show you here very quickly, is this, if you look at number 58, well, that goes in right after number 59, okay? And there's number 90, which obviously is after 89 right there. And so these two on the bottom actually go in here. So what happened, the problem is, it makes the periodic table fairly long. And so what has been done is those two groups down at the bottom have been removed, kind of pulled out of the periodic table, and that's what we see. But if we were to put them back in, it would look as follows, okay? It would stretch it out quite a bit. 
So this is an example of the long periodic tables. Now, over the years, there's been a variety of different ways to rearrange, to arrange these elements. This is one alternative periodic table that's been around for a bit. They call it the spiral periodic table. There's another one that I, I, I kind of like. Um, th what this one does is actually predicts a whole section of elements should be coming out over here and predicts what the properties would be and so on and so forth. So, you know, if we ever get to that point where we're making them, uh, we certainly would, uh, that's where they would go. Okay, here's number 18 right here. And then obviously we go 19 and so forth. So that's an, another product table. But what what's happens is that we keep the, this format. We have kept this format until, I don't know, something comes along that's a little bit better, but nothing's really hit. Um, so this is the modern periodic table. I, we talked about Niels Bohr and how he introduced the idea of electrons, uh, electrons of being in, in uh, energy levels. Okay, and we talked about the table and how we got the S block, the D block, the P block, and F block elements. Okay, all dealing with respect to the orbits. Okay, so that's one. So we know that each horizontal. I've mentioned it that each horizontal row is called a period or slash AKA energy level, okay? So we got periods going across in the horizontal rows and the vertical columns, we call them groups. They used to be called families, family, but they're, they're groups. So, and we know now they, they're in that group because they're similar properties, just like Mendeleev. And we know now why, because the number of valence electrons. Now, the A elements, the ones that have the Roman numeral one through eight A, they have their own little name called, special name called the main group elements. The Bs, which is starts in the, both the, the, the D block and the F block, those are transition metals. Those are the B group, the B group uh, elements, okay? Transition metals. Uh, this represents the periods. We're familiar with that. And here's the, the verticals, which are the groups. Okay. Now, some of these groups have their own little extra special name. For example, group 1A, with the exception of hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen is not a metal. They have their own special name, and they're called the alkalide metals for the 1A. Next group in is the 2A group. They have the, their name is the alkaline earth metals. And then way over in the far right in group seven, where we had the fluorine, the bromine, the chlorine, the iodine, et cetera, those are called halogens. That group, that whole group are the halogens. And you may be familiar with these, you know, maybe you got a, a headlight halogen lamp, you know, some of those halogens are used there. Then the far column to the right, those, as you know, are called the noble gases. Okay. Now, the D block, as I stated, are called transition metals or the B group elements. We cannot predict their reactivity. Okay. What I mean is uh, the ones for the A, the metals in the 1A and the 2A and the 3A, we know that those guys are going to have. A, a specific charge, okay? And what do I mean by that? Well, let me pull up a, another, my, my periodic table, and you can probably mark up yours the same way. The group 1A metals, which are listed right here, the 1A, with the exception of hydrogen. Everybody there, everybody as we know has one valence electron. Everybody there, when they become an ion, will have a plus one charge. Okay, lithium becomes a lithium plus, sodium, sodium plus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, the group two A, which is the next group over, will all have a plus two charge when they become ions. So there's 12 elements there that you know their charge 
100% of the time. Now there's four more that I'm gonna to introduce to you. Aluminum, which I circled here. Always, aluminum will always have a plus three charge. I put I put them here in a blue in blue box. Zinc number uh, thirty always hundred percent of the time has a plus two charge. Silver, which is eight G, has a plus one charge, and then we go in one is C D, which is cadmium, also has a plus two charge. So, so those four metals, those four metals, and the first two columns are made up make up what we call what I call the sweet sixteen. Okay, 100% of the time, you know their charge. And that's important because what happens is when we start putting compounds together, we may not know what the negative charge group has, what the, 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 the anion charge is, but we do know what the positive charge is. And we can calculate what that negative charge is, okay? So um, the other thing, we're, we also know 100% of the time is the anions. And I'm only gonna do a few, of, I'm just gonna do so, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, oxygen down to selenium, and fluorine down to, let me just do iodine, okay? All right, group five, always 100% of the time, negative three charge. Group six, negative two charge. Group seven, negative one charge when they become ions. So you have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine elements that you know 100% of the time what their perspective charge will be, okay? And these are non-metals. They will gain electrons, okay? What that means is that everybody else is unpredictable. Everybody in here, the D elements and the F elements, we it's unpredictable. We can't do this type of prediction. For example, copper, three types of copper. Copper zero, which is the element, okay? Then we have copper plus one. Copper element can lose one electron. And guess what? Copper can also lose two electrons. Depends on the conditions. So in essence, there's three types there. Copper zero, the element. Copper plus one, copper plus two. Uh, another example would be iron. We have the elemental iron as iron zero, but we also have iron plus two, and we lost two electrons, and iron plus three. Okay, so we can't predict that. Here's iron right there. And there, there was copper right there, okay? And that's a true for all the other elements. We can't predict this, okay? But most of the time, the ones we can predict are bonded with the anion that we do know for 100%. So we can calculate which one of those metals we are working with. And what I mean by calculate? Remember, for these type of compounds that come together, uh, there must be an equal amount of positives and an equal number of negatives ions that come together to give you a net zero. Okay, so those the guys in the middle are called transition metals, the ones in green. And then the one, the, the next two rows are called the inner transition metals, okay? Inner transition metals, which is there. They also have their own extra special name. Uh, here, it, uh, the the ones labeled here with the kind of purple color, starting with CE, those are called the lanthanide. Okay, and then the row below it with the orange color is called the actinides. Now, the lanthanide series, they also have their extra name called their uh, rare earth metals. Very rare, rare earth, use a variety of uh, uh, material most electronic material. And then the actinides, literally every one of them is, is radioactive. Now, when it comes to these elements, uh, starting with element 93 forward, those are all man-made. Most of them all radioactive. 
and they're all created by these particle accelerators where you're getting particles smashing into each other very fast speeds to create new new material. Okay. Now, with that in mind, you could be asked questions like, all right, name the alkene metal in the third period. So we have to identify the third period or the third end level. And we have to identify, well, what group is called the alkaline metals? So well, that'd be group 1A. So the only one it could be has to be sodium, okay? The halogen, the halogen in the second period, okay? Halogens are in group seven. Second period, we count down, that only choice is fluorine. Okay. And then the uh, noble gases, which are the last column on your right-hand side, that's in the fourth period, that is KR, uh, AKA krypton. Not to be mistaken with kryptonite, <laughs> but totally different. All right, earlier I mentioned to you about metals, non-metals, well, here's this table, okay? You can see there on the pink side, the right side, those are the non-metals, including hydrogen, which is in group 1A. Now remember, just because it's in group 1A, hydrogen is not a metal. It's only there because it only has one valence electron. Now remember, everybody with one valence electron belongs in group 1A, okay? That's the only reason it's to the far right. Then the green color represents the metalloids. And then of the blue, so that means everything to the left of the stair step are the metals, including the inner transition metals, okay? So you can see from that picture, there's quite a lot more metals than non-metals. So, well, what about, we're, we're still talking about the periodic table. Let's talk about the radius of these elements, okay? I think, I think you already got the first trend, you know, it's a periodic table because there's a lot of periodicity, a lot of prediction that you can make here. And you can see here that as you go down the periodic table, it makes sense that the radius of the element gets bigger, right? Because you're increasing, as you go down the periodic table, you're increasing the protons, you're getting the bigger element, you're getting more electrons, the electrons have to fill in the energy levels, starting at first, second, third energy level. So obviously, when you compare an element in the second period compared to an element in the fifth period, the elements in the fifth period are bigger. Makes sense, right? Makes sense. So we talk about the radius, okay? And we're talking, that is the radius of the distance from the outermost electron to the nucleus. So as I stated, increasing, it increases as you go down the periodic table. And because we're just putting more electrons at higher energy levels, and it just makes sense the radius gets bigger, pretty self-explanatory. However, if you're within the energy level, there's a little bit difference as you go across the periodic table. Guess what? The radius gets smaller, okay? Or if you want to say, if, if you go from left to right, it gets smaller, or from right to right to left, it gets bigger. Tomato, tomato, same thing, okay? So here they're telling you it increases from right to left, which is the contrary, not contrary, but the opposite of what I just told you. The question is why, okay? Well, let's take a look at the periodic table and, and, and see what we have. Okay, well, let's, let's do a comparison. Let me change the color here. Uh, all right, let's just say we're looking at, uh, well, let's just look at sodium versus chlorine. Okay, well, first of all, what does sodium have? Sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons, okay? Whereas chlorine has 14 protons and 14 electrons. So, you know, it's a function of 11 versus 17 protons. So, chlorine has more positive charge 
Therefore, the electrons that it has, there's a lot more interaction with the electrons. It's more powerful. It's like adding a bunch of magnets together, if you will. If I got, you know, the forces involved with, you know, say two magnets, which I have here, is an X amount. But if I add a heck of a lot more magnets, I got a lot of, a lot of force going on here. Okay, with all these magnets combined. And so the interaction, the interaction of the uh, protons and electrons is greater as we increase the number of protons and electrons. The result is this, as we go across a crowded table, the core range radius gets smaller because those electrons are pulled in a lot stronger than say sodium which is in the other side of the, of the same period, okay? Let me go back here. So it increases from right to left. So and that's simply because the positive charge increases and the electrons have a stronger force. Keep this in mind because another property, if you're holding on to your electrons tighter, okay? What does that also tell you? That if I'm gonna, if I try to take an electron away, it's gonna be tough, tougher than an element that's on the left side of the periodic table. Okay, remember that. As I have more protons, more electrons, it's gonna be tougher as I uh, if I attempt to remove an electron. Okay. So we can use uh, this little two here to help you out to remember if you look at the the snowman here if you will the head the circles represent the different radius of the of the uh, atoms as you go down the periodic table the radius gets bigger okay but as you go across the periodic table within the same period the radius gets smaller so you take the snowman put it on its side it helps you remember the trend now when you're asked a question and they ask you why, they're not, they're not asking you to repeat the trend. We know what the trend is, but the why is, I've gone across the periodic table is we're increasing the number of protons and electrons, increasing the force and the electrons are being pulled and thus decreasing the radius, okay? This picture here gives you a general view of the radii of the elements. And you can see the general trend is going down the product table to get bigger, across to get smaller. Yes, of course, there's occasionally some fluctuation between here and there, because nothing, nothing is 100%, okay? But the general trend is as I just stated. Now you may be asked the question, okay, I got three elements here, silicon, terillium, and oxygen. Which one is larger? Okay. Well, you got to find them on their periodic table. Not necessary to sit and memorize the radii of all the elements because they do have radii. There's a lot of physical properties about them. It's not necessary. A lot of this stuff you can just determine from their position on the periodic table. And you can see I circled them. And so you can see here that TI is much bigger. It's in the bottom of the periodic table. You're going down the periodic table, okay? And so TE being having in the and having more energy levels is a bigger atom, thus has a bigger radius. Okay? If we look at magnesium, silicon, and sulfur, they're going across the same period, the same energy level. Okay, and so that means that sulfur being on the far right is holding on to its electrons much tighter than magnesium, which in, is in the far left. And that is because sulfur has more protons and more electrons. Not only that, think about this for a second. Earlier I told you non-metals gain electrons, metals want to lose electrons. And so sulfur wants to uh, gain electrons. Okay? It's not gonna lose them very readily because it has a lot of proton force there. 
So it's going to be a lot, it's a lot more easier to pick up electrons than it is to get rid of what they what it's got. Whereas the magnesium, you know, there's only two valence electrons. You know, give them up, no problem. Much more energetically to do that and to gain. Okay. All right. Now, on the course website, which I provided a link to, there are some additional uh, uh, videos on atomic size uh, done by uh, Dr. Kim. Uh, so feel free to view and get some more information about them. Okay. Now, keep in mind about the trend radius brings us to this. This is a property called ionization energy. What that means is this. It is the amount of energy required to remove an electron from a neutral atom, from an atom. And so here we have a picture of sodium, a, a reaction, going forward in the process from left to right to create the sodium ion plus an electron, okay? And that takes an X amount of energy to get that electron off. Some elements do not require a lot of energy because that valence electron is maybe loosely held, okay? Or it's a metal and it wants to give it up rather than keep it. And some elements require a lot more energy because they're holding on to their electrons much tighter, okay? So what we do know that the ionization energy increases up a group. So as you go up the periodic table within the group, it gets the ionization energy required to move an electron is greater. Now think about it. That that kind of makes sense here. We think think about think this through for a second. All right, let me let me draw something real quick. All right, let's say this represents the nucleus, okay? And then in some orbit, we have an, an electron. And so we got an X distance from here to there, okay? Now, if we have in, within the same group, it's valence shell, the electron is way out here. Obviously, they've got other electrons in here, but the outermost electron is way out whatever shell it is. You can see here that for, you know, this is A and B, B's electron is further away, okay? Yes, they both have valence electrons, same number. But B's electron is further away. And the interaction going on here between the electron and the, uh, and the nucleus is much stronger for A than it is for B. So therefore, it's going to take more energy to knock off that electron for A than it would for B simply by the fact that that electron is further away in B than it is at A, okay? And that's what they're, they're telling you right here. It is easier to remove electrons from a larger atom because those electrons are further away from the nucleus. And uh, going from left to right, the ionization increases, okay? For two reasons here. One, if you look at the periodic table, again, on the left side are the metals. And like I stated, metals want to lose electrons. So just by default of being a metal, they rather give up their electron. As we move over to the right side, that's where the non-metals come into play. And like I stated, Non-metals want to gain electrons. Therefore, there is going to take a lot more energy to want to, re to remove an electron. That's one reason. And the other aspect to think about is this. As we stated earlier, because of the radius, as you go across the periodic table, the radius gets smaller because there's more protons and more electrons. And the proton force is stronger. And the proton-electron force is stronger as you go to the far right. Again, it's going to take more energy to remove an electron because of that force being much stronger compared to the elements in the left-hand side, okay? So two reasons. One, it's either it's a metal, it's going to lose them. It's a non-metal, it's going to want to gain them. But if it's a non-metal, it has a lot more proton force going on than the metal. 
metals out there in their first. I'm going to give up its electron very rarely. This table uh, depicts the electronic force involved, the ionization force involved in uh, removing an electron. Okay, so we have energy here as the call energy in the far right. That's semi axis. E, EV is electron volts, but don't worry about that. Just think of it as energy. The very first element is right there. That's hydrogen. That takes about 10, it's we got 11, 12, about 13 and a half, 13 and a half energy units. And if we go across the product table, there's helium right there. That's probably about 24 and a half energy units to remove an electron for helium compared to about 13 and a half to remove it from hydrogen. And it makes it's consistent with the radius as you go across the product table. It's smaller. There's one proton electron force holding on to the electrons on tighter. So it took more energy for helium than it did for hydrogen. So then we wrap around the product table and we start right here. And this is lithium. Okay. Lithium about maybe about a little bit over five units of energy to remove an electron. And as we go across the periodic table all the way up to neon, that's probably about what, 21, 22 units, about 22 units of energy for neon. Big jump, right? Again, same reasoning. As we go across the periodic table, we're, we're going into the non metal region. They want to hold on to electrons much tighter because they got more protons, so that force is greater. Okay. And we go all the way up to neon, where it's just not going to give up their electrons very readily because the happy eight again. And then we come back to sodium and we start over again. Okay. And the trend goes up. Now you may notice as you go, that's sodium. And then we start sodium behind sodium. This is potassium. And then across the trend goes the slope of that line tends to get smaller decrease. Eventually, it's going to be very little change, okay? And, and it stands to reason, because you go down the periodic table, and you're down in the 6-7 period, well, that's the energy, um, the electrons are very far away from the nucleus, all right? So it's, it's not going to take a lot of energy to knock them out, because the element's bigger. You know, very simply, the elements are bigger, and those outside electrons are not being held on to the uh, nucleus with any amount of force or strength as compared to the smaller elements. Okay, so that kind of shows you ionization. Now, the ionization energy, by definition, again, let me repeat this, if I didn't do it earlier, it is, is defined up on top. That is the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron from a neutral atom. Okay, that's, that's important. Neutral atom, the element. Okay, because now uh, we're, in a bit, we're going to talk about another property called uh, electronegativity. And sometimes students get the two design. All right, but before we do that, let's, let's figure out here which has a higher IE. Okay, and we got three elements here. We got chlorine, aluminum, magnesium. Now, you can look at the periodic table and get, find the trend. Or if you if you look at those three choices, what is it? A, what is, is there one of these? Are they all similar or are they all different? I mean, what what's the difference between chlorine, aluminum, and magnesium besides being different elements with respect to metals and non-metals? Which one of these is a metal of these three? Who can answer that? Magnesium. Magnesium is a metal. Okay. Anybody else? I mean, any of the other ones? What about aluminum? Aluminum is a metal. I got it. Chlorine, not a metal. And the fact that if you identify the non-metal, and the other guys are all metals, then just by default, you know that the chlorine being a non-metal will have the highest ionization energy, okay? Compared to the metals and compared to the metals. 
because like I stated, metals want to lose electrons. Non-metals do not. And also the chlorine here is a smaller diameter and is holding on to its electrons much tighter. In this case, a little bit different because they're all in the same group and they're all, all of them are metals. So we can't use that to determine. So we have to just look at them and find this position in front of the table. And yes, every one of these elements have an ionization, ionization energy value. And you can look it up and that's fine, but there's no need to, because you would just be asked questions, relative questions, you know, which was, which one's more relative to this and this, or which one's less relative to this and this. And that's the question here. And it sees, you can see here that RB is the bigger element. And so it's electron all being in the same group. The, the thing that all three have in common is they have one valence electron in the outermost shell. The difference is lithium's valence electron is closer in than RB. Okay, therefore, lithium holds on to its electron with a stronger force than RB because RB is further away. Okay, and so for its ionization would be greater energy. Again, there's uh, YouTube's concern concerning uh, ionization energy on the uh, course website. So Dr. Kim again did a, does a very good job in explaining this. And, and it, like I stated, it does help sometimes to listen to someone else talking about a topic. Maybe uh, something clicks in if you're not getting something. All right, with this brings me to what's called electronegativity. Okay. Now, this is quite different from ionization energy because in IE, we dealt with a single out, uh, uh, element. With EN, we talk about bonded electrons, okay? And we're talking about specifically, earlier I stated there's only two types of compounds that we make, ionic compounds and molecular compounds. So we're only talking about molecular compounds, okay? And, and how do we distinguish between ionic, since I introduced that to you, let me, let me explain what I mean by ionic compounds and molecular compounds, and why it was important to determine who's a metal and who's a non-metal. Because once we know that, we know what type of compound you're dealing with. So let me, um, when we have a combination of a, a non-metal combined with a metal, type of compound that is created is an ionic compound. Okay. An example of that is something you put on your french fries. Sodium chloride. Okay. Is not, is not sodium a metal, right? And is not chloride a nonmetal? Hence, a, this is an example of an ionic compound. And so any metals, this is just sodium. It could be potassium chloride, potassium bromide, iron oxide, uh, uh, <laughs> infinite number of combinations. They are ionic compounds. Now, the thing about ionic compounds is this, is we look at them in, in this manner. They have a full negative charge and a full positive charge. We know that sodium, when it becomes an ion, has a positive charge. And this magnet represents sodium. And chloride, when it becomes ionic, or chlorine, I should say, becomes ionic, becomes chloride, it has a full negative charge. Negative and positives attract, and the bond that we call they make is really an attraction. Okay? And this is an, an, an example of an ionic compound, a sodium and a chloride. And they attract to each other simply because of the charge that they have. Now, one unique property about ionic compounds is that if I put these guys in water, guess what happens? They break apart and dissociate, okay? To form 
to be in solution the individual ions floating around in the water. Now, some of them dissociate 100%, some of them do not dissociate 100%, but they do dis dissociate a certain percentage, okay? But that's the main property that they all have, ionic compounds, they dissociate, which means, for example, if I have pure water, 100% water with no ions, deionized water, it will not conduct electricity. The moment I put a pinch of a, magnet, of a say, so pinch of salt, sodium chloride, you conduct electricity because those ions make it conductive, okay? These ions is, are what we need in our body to exist. Sodium is very important, muscle contraction. The chlorides, these electrolytes you may know them as also, are nothing more than the elements that have lost or gained electrons, okay? So that's an ionic compound. With respect to a combination of a non-metal, I'm just going to shorthand it, NM versus combined with another NM, non-metal, non-metal combination, we have a type of compound called covalent slash molecular. M O L E C -O M O. <laughs> yeah, I guess it does help to spell a little better. Molec molecular. Okay. An example carbon dioxide. Carbon is a non metal, oxygen is a non metal molecular compound. Okay. Now, um, when these are put in water, molecular compounds are put in water, they do not dissociate, okay? They stay intact and therefore are non-conductive because they stay intact. They don't make ions. And the difference here is, the, is where ionic compounds have this like magnetic attraction to each other and charge we call the electrostatic attraction between the positive and negative. The molecular compounds, what they actually do is they share electrons, they share a bond, okay? And you have either equal sharing or unequal sharing. And so if I draw water is another example of a molecular compound because you got H2O, which is two non-metals, hydrogen and oxygen combined. And I draw a line there to represent a bond between hydrogen and oxygen. And in that bond is two electrons. And I can draw it with oxygen and draw two dots, okay? I can draw two dots that represents two hydrogens that are being shared with the oxygen and the hydrogen. And that is a molecular compound. And because of this property called electronegativity, we can have either equal sharing or unequal sharing. And it's pretty self-explanatory about whether what's equal and what's not. You think about it for a second. You can see that the oxygen is totally different from the hydrogen, okay? So you can say just by viewing it that that is an unequal sharing. If I have, uh, let's say, um, a diatomic hydrogen gas bonded to hydrogen. And here we go, right there, that represents, that, that bond represents an electron there, okay? I've got two atoms that, that are the same. Common sense will tell you that, hopefully will tell you that these two guys are sharing that line together, those two electrons equally, okay? Is that is what we mean by equal sharing and non-equal sharing. Now, how do we know that? We know that because of this property called electronegativity. And that is the ability of an atom to attract the electrons onto itself while it is bonded to something, to another element. Fluorine is the most electronegative. Again, they, all these elements have electronegativity values and it's not necessary to memorize all these electronegativity values. Just use 
fluorine as your benchmark, as your reference point to determine who, which two atoms have are more electronegative, because that is determined by their position relative to fluorine. So let's say we have a bond. You can see that we have a bond between two hydrogens. Well, they're the same atom, so the electronegativity is equal. So their, their tug of war in that sharing is an equal sharing. But let's say we have a carbon carbon hydrogen bond. So we put a, a line with the carbon nitrogen bond. Okay. Carbon line nitrogen. So we're looking at a bond between a carbon and nitrogen. Well, is that equal or an equal sharing? Well, the fact that they're two different elements tells you automatically it's an unequal sharing. So the next question is, well, who's doing all the pooling? Well, we look for it on the product table relative to fluorine, and carbon is about right here, nitrogen is about right there. Not to scale, but that's where they're at, okay? Nitrogen is closer to fluorine. Therefore, nitrogen, in this example, pulls the electron density toward it much more than carbon will. The result is that we create what's called a polar bond, okay? It's polar because we force one end to be more, more negative, if you will, than the other end. You got a pole, just like a battery has a pole. You got a positive and a negative on the battery, okay? The earth is a pole. You got the North Pole and the South Pole. And this bond, carbon and nitrogen, has a pole because the nitrogen is pulling the electrons greater onto itself with more force than the carbon. The electrons have a negative charge. So there's more electron density around the nitrogen than there is on the carbon, resulting in a partial negative on the nitrogen and a partial positive on the carbon, okay? And that is due to the electronegativity. And what we mean by polarity, these molecular bonds, there are two types of bonds underneath molecular bonds. One is called nonpolar. You're familiar with nonpolar molecules. Can, they, can you think of something that's nonpolar that you may use around the kitchen? Here's your hint. It definitely doesn't dissolve in water at all. How about, how many like Italian dressing? Because if you do, you're eating a non-polar species and a polar species. So you have a, if you have a bottle of, non, of uh, Italian dressing at home, let it sit for a while. Doesn't that break up into two layers? You have a oil layer and a aqueous water layer. The oil layer is non-polar. Okay, because they have nonpolar bonds. They're all molecular bonds, but it's nonpolar because they're equal sharing the electrons. Whereas the water layer is a polar layer because there's unequal sharing of those electrons creating the pole. Hence H2O, that example here, very polar because you have hydrogen and oxygen. I, oxygen is, is two, di, two dissimilar atoms, polar molecule, okay? All right. Um, it's all driven by electronegativity. This concept of electronegativity, it, it's important that you grasp it, you understand it, because it's coming, it will come back. We're going to use this time and time again, because this whole thing I just talked about, we're going to talk about again, okay? Because this then drives us to the, the predicting uh, things, whether something will dissolve in water or not. Our reference point is water because it's very polar. And like I said, we know that oil and water don't mix like Italian dressing. They separate, okay? Uh, if you're using, you know, there's, there's some makeup out there I'm told I grew up with uh, you know, five sisters, so I look like Halloween every night. You put the stuff on them to get that makeup on off because you needed a non-polar cleanser to get the makeup off, okay? Because some, there's, I'm told there's some makeup out there that's like hurricane proof, 
You know, you hit it with water, it won't come off. And then there's some makeup up there that's not water, that's kind of water soluble. That water hits it, it will run. You know, it's, so, and that's a function of polarity and elect electronegativity and a function of these crazy electrons again. <laughs> All right, but a lot of this will be coming up a lot more later on. This is a very important concept with respect to compounds and the properties that they have. Of course, we know noble gases don't have electronegativity because you know they they don't form bonds. They they're they're happy as they go. They got eight bonds, eight electrons around it. Yeah, they're not gonna do anything. So here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Chapter, the end of chapter six. And any any questions? I tell you, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not going to jump into chapter seven. We, we only, we have a little time left, but um, uh, go ahead and uh, use, I mean, I'll, I'll be open for any questions, but we'll, we'll, we'll knock it, we'll stop it here. And then next Friday, um, if you have questions, you want to bring them here, that's fine. We can talk about it. Uh, any questions because the exam is chapters four, five, and six. If you have any questions about any of the problems, we, you, we can bring them to class on Friday. If not, we'll continue with the chapters. Uh, you'll see now that, you know, things will settle down as far as uh, we'll be ahead. The first three chapters are kind of, um, a lot of information is given to you in a short period of time. And so it looks like we had to, we're rushed, and I had to move the times around a little bit as far as the due dates. But I think now things now are starting to settle out, and we'll be approximately, um, in our case, because we meet once a week, it'll be roughly two chapters a session, two, two and a half, something like that. Our other classes about one chapter, one chapter a week, maybe two chapters at a time. Okay, well. If you don't have any questions, uh, you guys have a good weekend, safe weekend, and we'll see you next Friday.